All right, I think since we've got a lot to cover tonight, we're going to get started, and hopefully more people will just join as they're able to. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. Hopefully you can all hear me all right. Uh, my name is Jeff Chandler. For those of you who tuned in for our November webinar on biomimicry, uh, welcome back. And for those of you um, joining an EU Week webinar for the first time, we're glad to have you here. We've got a great presentation lined up for you tonight on the theme of green engineering in the elementary classroom. As I've noted in the chat box to the right of your screen, your microphone has been muted to make sure we can hear the presenters clearly. Of course, we still want this to be an interactive webinar and welcome all feedback and questions. We just ask that you contribute through the chat feature to the right. If you cannot see the column on the right, your chat and attendance list may be minimized to the upper right. So you can go ahead and maximize that as you would any other window. Um, to make a comment or ask a question, simply type your comment or question into the text box and click send. Notice that your comment or question can either go to everyone or you can select a specific recipient. We ask that you address all questions intended for our presenters to NEEF host instead of the specific presenter or the group. This will make it easier for me to collect questions so that our presenters can respond to them later in the Q&A segments of the webinar. We will have time to answer these questions at the end of each presenter's talk, but you should feel free to enter questions into the chat box as they come to mind throughout the presentation. If the slides are appearing slightly too large or too small for your screen, you can adjust the sizes using the zoom percentage option in the bottom left of your screen, um, or you can also just say fit to screen under the view uh, menu. The audio and visual portions of this webinar and a list of links and resources described in the webinar will be available at eeweek.org following this live broadcast. Before I introduce our presenters for tonight, I want to give you a brief introduction to National Environmental Education Week, or EE Week. EE Week 2014's theme is Engineering a Sustainable World, and it's being sponsored by Samsung. It will take place April 13th to 19th this year, as part of our multi-year focus on greening STEM. Each year, we focus in on one of the STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, and math, and look at how developments and teaching practices in that field are being used to enhance environmental education. When looking to engineering for solutions to some of the world's toughest environmental challenges, it makes sense to start teaching the basic principles at a young age, which is why the topic of tonight's webinar is so important. I'm going to quickly run through the agenda for this evening so that you all have an idea of where we're headed. Our first presenter will be Kristen Sargianis from Engineering is Elementary, and she'll give us an introduction to, oh, I think someone just joined us. She'll give us an introduction to engineering at the elementary school level. Then she'll take us through the idea behind EIE's units and give us a closer look at one particular lesson that has strong ties to environmental engineering. Our second presenter tonight will be Jessica Sylvia from Frank M. Sylvia Elementary School, and she will be speaking from her own experience as an elementary school teacher who has used a variety of engineering lessons in her classroom. Kristen Sargianis is the Director of Professional Development for the Engineering is Elementary project based at Museum of Science in Boston. A member of the EIE team since 2004, Kristen has facilitated more than 50 professional development workshops in 15 different states. Prior to focusing on professional de development efforts, Kristen worked on the development of the EIE curriculum units. She has also been a K-2 classroom teacher, um, and she received her BS in biology from Cornell University. Jessica Sylvia has been a teacher for 19 years, primarily in grades five and six. In her close work with the Boston Museum of Science over the past four years, she has done everything from piloting new units for EIE and even filming the unit lighting, lighten up, to becoming a teacher in residence. Since partnering with the Museum of Science, she has been finding new ways to integrate engineering across all curriculums. Now that you know a little more about our presenters, we'd like to learn a little more about who's in the audience. You should all have a button in the right-hand column that allows you to raise your hand. Um, some of you who are on different devices I'm not sure where the button would be located, but for most of you, it should be right above the chat box. Um, when I ask about one of the categories that applies to you on the screen, please click the raise hand button. 
And please do not unclick the button until I ask so that uh, we can take a quick tally and see who's in the audience tonight. So do we have any kindergarten through second grade teachers in the audience? Just go ahead and click the raise hand button if that applies to you. All right, Emily, I see that. Great. So, so far, Emily, that's you. Great. Okay, Kristen and Jessica, it looks like we've got someone who's a K2 teacher. All right, Emily, you can go ahead and lower your hand. And then, do we have any third to fifth grade teachers? And don't worry if you're not able to um, raise your hand at all. That's fine. We'll have a survey afterwards where you can uh, contribute what sort of educator you are, if you'd like. Okay, so we've got three third to fifth grade teachers. Thank you to the people there. You can go ahead and lower your hands virtually. And uh, do we have any elementary science specialists? Great, we've got four elementary science specialists. Oh, five. OK. Um, you can go ahead and lower your hand. And do we have any middle school teachers? Nope, OK. They're in bed already. All right. Um, do we have any administrators? All right. Nope. And uh, do we have anyone who's just joining for fun or just is interested? Hopefully. <laughs> yep. Good. All right. We've got a good number of people who are just genuinely interested in engineering at the elementary level. Great. Thank you. All right. And then, so among the people who, uh, well, you could either be a formal or informal educator, but has anyone taught engineering in some respect to their students? Go ahead and raise your hand. Okay, a good number of people. Wow, great. So we've got probably 15 people who would say they've taught engineering. All right, great. You can go ahead and lower your hands. Uh, well, Kristen, um, I'd say that gives you a pretty good idea of who we're talking to in the audience today. So I'm going to pass control over to you and let you begin your part of the presentation. All right, I think you've got control now. Oh, you might be muted. Hold on. That's on my end. Uh, let me see. I will, all right, and now you should be oh. unmuted. Sorry about that. All right. Hi, everyone. This is Kristen Sargianis. Um, so first, I wanted to thank Jeff and the National Environmental Education Foundation for having us as part of their webinar series. We're really excited to be here. And as he said, I wanted to start by just giving you a little bit of background information on why we think it's so important to begin kids engineering when they're in elementary school. So about 10 years ago, our team did a little survey where we asked about 500 elementary school students to draw an engineer at work. And we wanted to see what kids thought engineers did for their job before we started creating engineering curricula. And when we analyzed their drawings and their descriptions, we noticed that there were some pretty big themes. And I'm sure for those of you who have done engineering with students before, these might not be too surprising. And so we learned that children tend to think that engineers, oh, there we go. Oh, how do, the slide is not changing, Jeff. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, that children tend to think that engineers build buildings. So they are the construction workers who use their screwdrivers, and in this case, maybe a sword, to actually construct houses or roads and bridges. That engineers um, fix cars, engines, and machines, and many kids noted that because the word engine is in the word engineer, they made that association. That engineers use or fix computers. Again, there's no mention of engineers being people who design or improve things like cars, engines, and computers. 
And finally, our youngest students in particular often said that engineers drive trains. And so while not an incorrect use of the word engineer, what our study showed in general was that students have a really narrow and in many ways incorrect view of what engineers do. Um, they really didn't mention anywhere that engineers use math and science in their work. They didn't really mention engineers being creative. And we did notice that when we could tell the gender of their drawings, nearly all of students' pictures were of men. And so what we're hoping is that we can, um, through our curriculum and by including engineering in the elementary classroom, that we can help students understand that engineers are people who use science and mathematics and their creativity to design technologies that solve problems. And over the past several years, we've come to see that engineering and technology have really become more prominent in K-12 education. And so here in the Next Generation Science Standards, they define engineering as a process of designing solutions to solve problems. So they're talking about engineers as problem solvers, which was not something that students mentioned in their drawings. And we want them to um, think about technology as everything that's human made in the world around them. So not just those cars and computers, but things like medicines and ways to clean up the environment, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. And so through this, we've noticed that there are a couple of reasons why we think it's really important for young children to be exposed to engineering. Because first, they're growing up in um, a technological world. The products of engineering are all around them. And so we want students, as they grow up, to be literate in the developments and innovations that are going on in their world. It's also a way to help kids make sense of math and science in a really meaningful way. And it also allows kids to um, authentically engage in 21st century skills like collaboration and creativity um, and communication. And more broadly, we want students from a young age to really understand what it is that engineers do for their jobs in the hopes that maybe we can help create the next generation of engineers. And as I said earlier, the next generation science standards include engineering for students starting in first and second grade. So they are really putting an emphasis on early engineering. And so the project that I work for is called Engineering is Elementary, and we're based at the Museum of Science in Boston, and we've been around since 2003. And we are a curriculum for elementary school students that integrates engineering and technology with the science topics that elementary school teachers are already doing in their classrooms. And we were funded by the National Science Foundation, and through that funding, we have 20 different units. And here you can see a table that showcases all of them. Um, and so if an elementary school teacher was picking the unit that would be a best fit for his or her classroom, you would have them start over there in the left-hand column, looking at the science topic and figuring out which EIE unit second column best integrates with that because we want this, um, the students to take what they're learning in science and apply it to solve an engineering problem. And I'm going to give you a specific example of that in a minute. We also wanted to showcase the really broad range of things that engineers do in different fields of engineering. So you can see our engineering fields cover everything from civil and electrical engineering to smaller fields like bioengineering and optical engineering. And then we wanted to have our units integrate with other subject areas because in most elementary schools, teachers are teaching not just science and engineering, but mathematics and literacy and social studies. So we've set the context um, for our units in different countries all over the world. And I'll show you a little bit more about how that plays into the, the classroom. But regardless of which of these 20 units a teacher is teaching, they all follow the same structure. So this, the content changes. So they all begin with a lesson that introduces students to the broad idea of technology, that it's more than just 
computers, and iPads. That is everything that has been designed by humans to solve a problem. And then they begin their engineering with a storybook. And so we have a story that goes with each of our 20 units, and here's, here they all are. And in the story, a child who lives in a different country around the world, some are set here in the U.S. as well, has an engineering problem that he or she needs to solve. And with the help of an engineering mentor, that child um, goes through the engineering design process and comes up with a solution to a problem, which is the same problem that students in the real classroom will work to solve themselves. We then want to give students a broader sense of an engineering field, because they're going to read about that engineering field in the storybook. Um, and we want them to get a sense of all the different kind of, of, kinds of things that, for example, electrical engineers might do for their job. So through a hands-on collaborative lesson, we want to give them a sense of that engineering field. We then have the kids embark on an engineering design challenge, where they are um, tasked with designing a technology to solve a problem. And before they do that, they work on a controlled experiment to collect data, usually about materials and their properties, that will help them be more successful in designing their technologies in the fourth lesson. And I'm going to go from here and give you um, a more specific example of an EIE unit so you can um, think about that framework with some content on it. But all of the units, regardless of what topic they cover, they're designed to integrate across different subject areas, particularly science, literacy, social studies, as well as mathematics. They all take about 9 to 11, 45-minute class periods. And we leave it up to the teacher to decide whether she wants to do it every day, once a week, twice a week. There's a lot of flexibility in the schedule. Um, and we also know that teachers have students of different abilities in their classrooms. So we included lots of modifications in there so that a teacher could differentiate the activities and make them appropriate for more advanced or more basic learners. And so since this is National Environmental Education Week, we wanted to showcase one of our units that focused on environmental engineering. And this one is titled a slick solution cleaning an oil spill. Um, and this ties in with the elementary school science topic of ecosystems and food webs and food chains. Um, and it focuses on the field of environmental engineering. And so we're going to start with the first lesson, lesson one, which is our storybook. And the storybook is, is titled, Tay is Pollution Solution. And Taya is a little girl who lives in the Pacific Northwest United States. She is a Native American girl, and she's a member of the Lower Elwha Klallam tribe. And she has a really cool thing. She has her grandmother's journal from when she grew up on the reservation. And so Taya and her friend Sam have been going around the, the area trying to create um, find the exact spots that her grandmother drew pictures of in her journal and take photographs of them. And so they're out one day by the river taking a picture, and they notice something on the surface of the river. They notice oil. Um, and they immediately realize that this is a problem. And they go back and tell um, the folks in their town what they saw. And Taya happens to know an environmental engineer. His name is Thomas. And he is back working on the reservation, and he is helping with this oil spill cleanup effort. And so he tells Taya about the different technologies that engineers use to help clean up oil spills, prevent the oil from spreading further than it already has, and also removing the oil from the water. And he realizes that Taya and her in-depth knowledge of the surrounding area through her grandmother's journal and also the photographs that she's taken can help the engineers who are working to clean up this solution because they can um, use her photos to identify where the oil has spread. And Taya, in turn, starts taking photographs of the cleanup efforts so that she can document what has been going on. 
But Taya wants to help. And so she and her mother work on, in, in their kitchen, they make a mini model oil spill. And they go through the different steps of the engineering design process and test out different materials to see which ones work best for cleaning up oil, either removing it from water or containing it. And her mother and Taya also have a discussion about how an oil spill might impact a surrounding ecosystem, that it doesn't just impact the organisms that live in the water because of food webs and food chains, it also impacts other organisms, both animals and plants in the surrounding ecosystem. And so the story serves a couple of, of purposes in our EIE units. We want to introduce the, the field of engineering and also connect back to that science content. So why might an environmental engineer need to know about food webs? Well, because he or she might need to think about how an oil spill or how other pollution might impact an, um, the surrounding environment. We also use it as a vehicle to introduce um, new vocabulary, science and engineering vocabulary, and we want to inspire kids to do the engineering challenge. So the kids in the classroom are also going to engineer ways to clean up a model oil spill, just like Taya did. Before we get to that, though, we move on to our second lesson. In this case, it's called an Enviro Mystery, but it's a uh, an opportunity for kids to get a broader sense of what environmental engineers do for their job. And so we, um, all of our lessons have guiding questions that go along with them. And in this case, our guiding question is, how do environmental engineers use their knowledge of soil and water to investigate environmental problems? So we're focusing on pollution. How do environmental engineers identify sources of pollution? And the children in the classroom are given a, a map of a fictional town that has a pollution problem. And they get a letter from the mayor of the town asking for their help in identifying what might be causing the sources of pollution in the pond and the garden in the town. And the children work in small groups, and they are tasked with checking out the pH of different sites around town and comparing the current pH to the pH at that site three years ago and thinking about if how the pH has changed and whether that site might be causing some of the pollution. Um, and here you can see an example of um, one student's work where he or she is, is marking off the different pollution levels and then also doing some analysis of their, their evidence, of their observations. And the students um, each test one site, but they share their data with the rest of the class so they're able to work together and collaborate and look at the bigger picture about how the pollution might be spreading across the town. So then the students finally get to embark on their engineering challenge. So they are going to be tasked with engineering a way to clean an oil spill that has happened in an ecosystem. And this is our engineering design process. This is the, the steps, the cyclical steps that engineers go through to help them st solve problems. And in lesson three, they begin here in the ask step and they think about what are the criteria for solving my problem, what are the constraints, and what science content might an engineer need to know in order to solve the problem successfully? And so their goal is to not just design the process for cleaning the oil spill, but also try to prevent the oil spill from harming the surrounding ecosystem as little as possible. And so to help them understand first um, about that piece of impacting the ecosystem, our guiding question first focuses on helping kids understand how might an oil spill affect an ecosystem. And we do that by having the children play different roles in a very simplified but age-appropriate model ecosystem. And we have them um, create first a food web. So how are these different organisms dependent on one another for food? And 
also how might they be dependent on a river for um, their, to meet their basic needs. And so here you can see some fifth grade students creating their food web out of yarn. And they model what might happen if one of them was impacted by tugging on their strings. And if you can feel your strings being tugged, that means you've been impacted by the oil spill. And through this activity, they learn that every organism in an ecosystem has the potential to be impacted by pollution. We then have the students focus on the materials that will be available to them for designing their oil spill cleanup process. And this is really important for giving kids the opportunity to examine materials before we ask them to solve a problem with them. And so the students are given different materials to contain oil and remove oil from water. And they test each material in a controlled way, one at a time, and make observations about how, the different, how well each material works. Um, and so here you can see some students' drawings and notes and ratings on how well the different materials worked. So first they test for how well it contains oil, and then they test how well it removes oil. Um, and you can see this student took some very meticulous notes about how the different materials performed. And now that they have all of this background information, we want them to put it to work and apply their knowledge of how pollution impacts an ecosystem along with how well different materials and tools work to clean an oil spill into actually solving the problem. So we want them to put everything they've learned together. So how can they use what they've learned about ecosystems and about materials to help them design their oil spill cleaning process? And this is where they go through the rest of the steps of the engineering design process. And we have them work in small groups. And we ask them to, um, to first, on their own, brainstorm, imagine some different ways that they might clean an oil spill. And then they have to work together with their group and decide on the, the steps and their, their plan for their oil spill cleaning process. So on this page, you can see the students chose what materials they want to use in each step and how they're going to use each material. And then they get to implement their oil spill cleaning process. They get to actually follow their plan and try it out and then evaluate how well their designs work, how successful they were by a set of criteria that we've established. So we have them look at whether any of the oil um, made it onto the shore. So you can see the little gravel shores there. They look for oil there. They also test and see how much oil is left on the surface of the water. And then we also have them calculate with a budget how much their oil spill uh, process cost to implement. So we gave them a budget. And so here, during the create step, you can see this student um, recorded her different scores for how well her oil spill, her team's oil spill cleaning process performed. Um, and you'll notice at the bottom that the teacher here asked the kids to predict their scores before they implemented their, their designs. And this child predicted that her score would be between a 6 and an 8. And in, in this particular challenge, you wanted um, the lowest score possible. Well, it turned out that her team got a score of 19, which was a little bit higher than they were hoping. But that leads into the next step of the engineering design process, that we always want students to have an opportunity to go back and improve on their designs. So we really emphasize that failure is OK. And it's, it's, it's all right if your design doesn't work the first time, because that's what happens in the real world. Engineers improve things multiple times before they're finished. And so the students reflect on what worked well for, about their oil spill cleaning process and what didn't work so well. And then they'll focus on what of their, which of their scores they're going to try to improve. And then they get to go back and plan again, come up with a new plan, try it out, score it again, and see whether their improvements worked. And we try to encourage teachers to have their students improve their designs multiple times. 
And so in a nutshell, that's, that's one example of our EIE units. And as I said earlier, regardless of the content in the unit, the, the structure and the learning progression through those four lessons is always the same. Um, I should say that our units are not assigned to specific grade levels because they're meant to be taught in conjunction with science. So in this case, for example, we would assume that the teacher has already taught her students about food webs and ecosystems, and the kids would then review and apply that knowledge towards the engineering challenge. Um, we do have a couple of other engineering as elementary units that are great ties to environmental engineering and green engineering. Um, the kids can design solar ovens, water filters, or, or windmills. Um, but again, these are meant to be taught in conjunction with science. So these, the, these three units respectively tie in with energy and heat transfer, water cycles, and wind and weather. And I will just leave you um, with our project's website. We are at EIE.org. And if you log on to our, our website, we have tons of resources for teachers, um, including classroom videos. You can go online and see the EIE units being taught by real teachers in action, including Jessica, who you'll hear about in a minute, so you can get a sense of what engineering actually looks like. And I will turn it back over to Jeff for questions. Great. Thank you so much, Kristen. Um, we can probably leave control of the presentation slides with you since we'll be going right back to Jessica shortly. But uh, we'll just stay on this question slide for a little bit while we relay some questions from people in the chat box to you. Um, had a couple questions come in already, and uh, feel free to submit any more. And we'll take a couple minutes now, uh, not too long because we don't want to keep anyone too late. But um, our first question came from, uh, let's see, Jean. And she asked, are the materials simple to find for these activities? Um, so I can answer that, and then I would love to hear what Jessica, how Jessica would answer that. Um, when we were developing the EIE curriculum, that was one of the things that we tried to focus on, was making sure that the materials that the kids use are easy to access, um, they're inexpensive. Um, we do sell materials kits to go along with the curriculum, but most of the things that you'll need you can easily find at a Target, a Walmart, um, a Home Depot, or Lowe's, a craft store, a supermarket, there's nothing terribly fancy that needs to go with them. Right. No, and I agree, and, and everything is certainly, um, you know, kid and user friendly, so it's not anything that you would need any kind of special training to in order to uh, use it with your students, so. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, we had another question come in from Pat, and he asked, is there a specific grade level that these units, or I think specifically the oil slick solution, uh, are designed for? So when we wrote the curriculum, we um, didn't write them aimed at specific grade levels, um, again, because they're meant to be taught in conjunction with science. So what we did was we looked at the science topic and decided whether it was most commonly taught in upper elementary school, so grades three through five, or lower elementary school, grades one and two. Um, the unit that we just talked about, the cleaning and oil spill, um, that is um, designed for grades three through five. But all of our units include modifications to make them either less challenging for younger or more basic students or more challenging for older or more advanced students. Great. Um, we had a question from Liz. In the food web activity, how do you have the kids assess how they each depend on the river? So in that activity, one child is playing the river, and when they start to talk about the river, each child playing an organism, we ask them, how do you use the river? How, is it to, how do you use the river to meet your basic needs? And some of them use it for shelter. Some of them might use it for, for water. Some of them might actually only be impacted by the river by um, eating organisms that live in the river. Um, so we have them really think about that critically. Great. And I think we're going to want to move along uh, to Jessica's part of the presentation soon. But I just want to ask uh, one other question. And for those of you who have uh, entered questions, we will either post answers online or I can relay those questions to Kristen and Jessica afterwards, and they can respond in a direct email. 
Um, but Kristen, I'm, I was wondering, does EIE do any uh, educator classes or demonstrations where teachers can go and learn about some of these activities firsthand? We do. Um, that's my whole team's job. So we do a lot of professional development for teachers as well as other teacher trainers where we um, work with teachers to get them ready to implement engineering education in the classroom. So we do a lot of workshops here at the Museum of Science in Boston, and we also will travel and come to your school or your location. If you log on to our website, there's a whole section titled Workshops. You can go check out our offerings. Um, we are going to be at the National Science Teachers Association Conference in Boston this year, and we have lots of sessions there as well if any folks are going to be attending. Great. Well, we, uh, so for those questions that have come in, we will try to either get back to those at the end of the presentation or respond individually. But right now, I think I'll, I'd like to turn it over to Jessica, um, and you can begin your part of the presentation. All right. Thanks, Jeff. So um, for my end of the uh, presentation, I was asked to give the educator perspective. And so I'll be going over um, the five pieces you see on this slide, um, and my teaching experience, the benefits and the challenges and successes that I've um, encountered uh, using uh, engineering with this uh, age bracket of students, and then also um, some, new some tips for teachers that are new to um, teaching this curriculum. So um, since 2006, um, I've been finding ways of uh, integrating engineering into my science lessons. So um, it wasn't always um, engineering as elementary, but it has because since my school has bought into the curriculum, um, it, it now is primarily using um, those kits and that, that premise. Um, in fact, my students, since they've been using it for a couple of years from grade level to grade level because it's a school-wide um, a school-wide focus of ours, um, they really know, you know what the EDP, what the, environment, the engineering design process is, and they are actually finding ways to incorporate it, uh, even more ways than I could think of myself. Um, and that just goes hand in hand with uh, creating STEM units, um, which I did some work with Framingham State University, and then certainly um, adding to my experience with, through professional development. And so there's really two branches that I felt uh, when I was thinking about the benefits of teaching engineering. And so the first one is, uh, I think, what all science teachers and elementary teachers want to make clear to their students is that, um, you know, this is real. This is what goes on in the real world. This is, um, this is not just something that you're going to learn about in the classroom, that this has a connection to your real life. Um, and so once they're able to recognize and understand the, the whole process and where engineering is, they're coming to me telling me about um, observations that they're making outside of school or in other classes and how it connects to engineering. And so seeing that relationship and then thinking about it under that premise of, you know, it always starts with asking a question and then it's always a cycle that doesn't end because there's always room for improvement. Um, they re it really helps to, for them to apply what they've learned. Um, and so, of course, as Kristen had said, they need that foundation of the science content, but from there, it's really just that higher end of that Bloom's taxonomy of, of adding in the application, the synthesis, and, that, and, and this way they can show and make clear what they know, not just answering multiple choice questions to show their full understanding. Um, and then from there, um, moving beyond just that strict uh, content, um, but to create deeper understandings that strengthen knowledge by seeing not only the creativity, but also um, being able to, for them to practice um, with hands-on opportunities to see what's, how somebody else would attack that same kind of problem and what types of things uh, would be successful even though they're different, so that there's not always just one answer to every question. And so, like I had said, my school um, has, has uh, curriculum units uh, through EIE um, that range in our, in our school. We're a pre-K to five school. Um, we're still now figuring out how our pre-K students can participate, um, but certainly our kindergarten students uh, all the way up through fifth grade are using um, these, uh, these units and using this framework for thinking. And because the EIE units are built around that same framework, 
I'm very lucky at this point to be the recipient of the benefit of all of that prior work where they're coming to me already knowing uh, how this is going to go and really spending more time around that lesson three and lesson four, four of putting it into practice. And so as with anything that's worthwhile, there's always some challenges. And so in teaching engineering to younger students, uh, again, I broke this down into two, uh, two important points. So of course, you always have to bring it to the cognitive level that matches your students. And so even in one classroom, you can have a wide range. And so what's great about uh, EIE is they always give an advanced and a basic level of the same assignments. So the pages look pretty much the same, and the expectation and the standard for that they're going to be held to, under, to knowing by the time they're done with it is identical, but the workload or the, the framing of the question or the framing of the directions might be slightly different so that it can get to the level where the student is. So the student's not going to struggle so much with understanding what am I supposed to do, but really putting that content into, into use. Um, and then that helps, as we know, to move the student from wherever they are to where they need to be. So it's not going to leave any students out. It's not going to leave the student out who, in fact, this year I have some students who did more engineering than others because they were in a different uh, pathway of classes last year. And so EIE even has extensions, and so I can give them that enrichment or that extension piece, and they're still growing in their understanding, uh, even though they might have had more basic or foundation knowledge than the rest of the class. Um, and then as we always uh, worry about as educators is, all right, so when am I going to have the time to do this? And that, that tends to be the biggest problem in teaching anything like science that's hands-on is, well, to do an hour-long lab or activity or um, experiment with the students, I need at least 20 to 25 minutes to set everything up. And so the people at EIE really did a nice job of giving the teachers the heads up of, okay, here's what you need to plan and prep ahead of time. This is about how long it's going to take you. Um, so this way, um, with the, the scaffolding already being there and the scope and sequence already being very clearly laid out, it makes it very easy to follow. Um, but also lets you know it's going to take you at least you know x amount of minutes to um, to get ready for this. So you've got the the warning of you know what needs to be done on the teacher end even before the kids walk in the door. So um, so it's excellent that way. And considering how many how much cross curricular uh, connections there are, uh, using a little bit of your ELA time. Um, you know, to get at the content for the science through the storybook, or even uh, incorporating some writing pieces, um, you can really uh, overlap your content areas and still um, still have success in getting to your end result. So, on that topic of success, um, knowing that um, the students will be building on this from year to year, um, they become they they. Constantly, my students who I know have done the engineering in third and fourth grade, they're telling me, oh, this is just like last year when we blah, blah, blah. And so they're, they're building their thinking around the content, but also on successes or failures or areas of improvement from ex their own experiences around inquiry and engineering design from previous years. And then, um, and then with that, I found that over the course of the past eight years of, of doing these units that the students are even pushing me beyond where I had originally started them from since they are coming to me at a higher level, they're even um, exceeding my expectations as far as where we'll get to and, and I, I'm constantly surprised at where we end up and pleasantly surprised at where we end up. Um, and then also with that is that the students are using their understanding of engineering to solve a multitude of challenges. They're, they're using it, they can apply the engineering design process as a cycle to when we discuss life cycles, when we just discuss you know, uh, physical science properties around energy. They're making all of these connections from different types of cycles and how one ends, the next one picks up. Um, they're, they're, um, they're absorbing that thinking around that mistakes are actually a good thing. Um, because it uh, provides them with an opportunity to make improvements. And so they'll even say things to me around, 
you know, things that we're doing in literacy about, well, when I predicted the story was going to be about this, but, oh, look, I was wrong, and look at how much I learned. And so they're, they're using, they're making those cross-curricular connections. And then um, we're seeing that as well with our, our state test scores as well, that especially as we're moving into more performance-based assessments, that these types of experiences are going to lend themselves into the students imagining where where uh, a solution might come from, and that it doesn't have to be held to an A, B, C, or D answer choice. So as far as new teachers go, um, I, I think of it uh, as a stairwell. I'm a very visual person, so I think of it as you know, a set of stairs. And so certainly, you have to know where you, both you as an educator and where your students are starting from. Um, don't bite off more than you can chew. Um, it's certainly okay. It might not be in your uh, in in your comfort zone to be learning with your with your students. But I, from experience, I can tell you that I've stayed at least a half a step ahead of them, um, if not a full day or a full lesson ahead of them. At least you know halfway ahead of them. So this way, I at least know where they're headed towards. But it's okay because sometimes these units will bring you into a direction where you can uh, have another conversation that was then going to connect to some content down the road. So as long as you know your standards and you know your content, um, it is certainly okay um, to modify as you go along. And then of course, as with any kind of science or hands-on activity, you want to make sure that you're prepared for anything. So always have extra materials on board um, and certainly adapt to the questioning or to any sort of um, not, I'm not going to say mishap, but any sort of um, break from the trail that you had in your mind. If you've got, if you've got a, a, a dead set path in your head of where this is supposed to go, you need to let go of that and just realize that this is the goal we want to get to. So there's always many paths that will get you to the same end result. And then also, um, I know that we're all under time constraints to be finished by a certain time, but very often I find that I could start one of these units at the beginning of the year and maybe we kind of strayed from the original path. I'll go back to it um, periodically throughout the year and my students keep science notebooks that we can flip back to. Remember when we did you know, whichever engineering unit and we'll go back to it and we'll make those connections again and we'll revisit it. And so it doesn't all have to get finished at that one point. But certainly, don't be in that rush because you're going to um, you're going to realize that there's so much more that you can get out of this than uh, than you might have expected. And then certainly, um, take the time to celebrate the success. So whether that be independently with small groups of students, uh, independently with small groups of students, or with whole classes, uh, take that time to really think about how how far they've gotten. Because with every unit you do that whole group is going to move so much further because you stand there and you recognize each individual and class-wide um, class success. That was great. Thank you, Jessica. Yeah. Um, so please feel free to send in your questions if you have them through the chat box, and I will relay them. So a question we had, or I mean, sorry, <laughs> Jessica, we had one question come in from Terry. Uh, that I think was uh, sort of touched on, but I think you've worked with a couple different age groups, and so mm -hmm. have you found that some units work better with younger students? Or I, I think what works best is really aligning it to whatever curriculum you're teaching for this, uh, that goes along with the, the standards or the frameworks that your school district holds you to, because they're really going to need that content knowledge to help them through it. Um, as far as um, grade level or age level, development level of the engineering unit. Um, sometimes if I felt that, the, that it was too hard for them, then I might have done it as a teacher demonstration as opposed to a student hands-on lesson. Um, I currently um, teach in a departmentalized fifth grade team. So I, have, I see three different groups of fifth grade students, and I'll tell you that I have, um, that I have done the same lesson three different ways because I've got one, um, one non-inclusion class, one and two inclusion classes with varying percentages of special needs students. So I've done it in all different ways and so I really wouldn't worry so much about which unit matches the grade level. I would worry about how much content are they going to have to help them understand what they're working on. That's a great point. 
Uh, we actually had two of the same question come in from both Chris and Terry. And the question is, how many units do you typically teach in a year? Um, my um, grading periods, we do quarters. Um, so uh, usually in one school year, I will teach four units, one each quarter. If I might jump in, I would say that that is probably atypical in our experience. Jessica and her school have been doing engineering for, I mean, eight years probably now. With most of the teachers that we work with, they'll start with one engineering unit per year, maybe two, and work up to, to two to, to four. But we recommend start, start with one, see how it works, and then you can always integrate more after that. Great. Thank you. Um, oh, we just had a flood of questions, so I'm going to try to pick through them here. Um, let's see. Do you know how educators in other settings, such as nature centers, use this material? Are there any major differences? Um, so in terms of using the curriculum in informal settings like nature centers or out-of-school time programs, we, we have had them use the, the EIE curriculum. Um, sometimes it'll be a uh, if they're going to see the same children for, for multiple days or as part of like a camp or a school vacation week program. The EIE project has um, an entire out of school time curriculum that's designed for informal learning settings. It's called Engineering Adventures and Engineering Everywhere. You can find it right on our, on our website, EIE.org. They are free and available to the public for, for download. They have a lot of the same design principles as EIE. They focus on kids' engineering technologies that solve real-world problems, but they focus more on um, 21st century skills like creativity, collaboration, innovation, um, and they're designed and tested in those kinds of settings. Great. Thank you. And this is from Chris. As a school, do you teach certain units at a particular grade level? Yes. Yeah, so for example, um, our third grade team um, does, because they teach a, a unit on um, states of matter, they teach the, they use the water unit when they're teaching after they've taught that content. And then um, also our third grade team um, uses the simple machines unit um, after they've taught the simple machines content. Um, as well, fourth grade does um, a hand pollinators and a model membrane unit as they connect that to their life science content. And then uh, primarily the, the units that I've taught in fifth uh, were the alarm circuits, um, the, the lighting systems, and um, the parachutes unit to go along, along with um, our earth and space science standards. Great. Wonderful. Um, let's see. Uh, we've got a question from Lillian of how do you assess the work? So do you want to talk about that first? I do. So um, as I had said, my students have science notebooks. And so um, my students are very well versed in using a rubric. We've got standards-based report card, which grades on a 1, 2, 3, 4 scale. So um, anytime when they're making an uh, a, a formal notation in their notebook, uh, they always get a preview of what the rubric looks like. And so I will formatively assess, um, especially from the students where I might not have had time to sit at their table or check in with them throughout the work, I will formatively assess their notebooks just to make sure that they're on the right track. Uh, but also um, EIE does have an assessment link uh, that goes along with each lesson. So you can give them a paper, pen, um, test uh, or a set of quiz questions or a, a, a design kind of uh, performance test to see if they've understood, comprehended what that, the premise of that lesson was so that you would know whether or not they were ready to move on. Um, and at EIE, we feel really strongly about when you're assessing students on an engineering unit that they are not assessed on how well their oil spill cleaning process or their water filter or whatever technology they design worked. 
um, from our standpoint, it doesn't matter if their design was successful. What's more important is how they moved through those steps of the engineering design process. Um, how did they record their data? How did they use their data? How well did they work with their team? So we, we provided some assessment tools both within the curriculum and on our website that lend themselves more to that sort of performance-based assessment rather than um, a, a standardized test. We do have those kinds of instruments, multiple choice instruments, because as part of our, our program, we do large-scale research on the, the curriculum. Um, but for teachers, things like notebooks or the kids' work in their, um, on their handouts is a far more telling way of seeing what they've learned. Great. Thank you. And again, I'm sorry if we didn't get to your question here, but we will uh, take it in and archive it and then get it back to you uh, in an answer very shortly, either online or through an email. I think right now we're going to move on because we're getting close to our time limit. Um, and I just want to thank both of our presenters tonight, uh, Kristen and Jessica, you've, done, you've both done a great job and we really appreciate the time and knowledge that you've shared with us tonight. I want to remind everyone that a video and audio recording of this webinar will be archived on our website at eeweek.org slash webinars, along with a PDF version of the slide presentation, so please check back soon for that and feel free to pass the link along to anyone else you think might be interested. Also, keep in mind our other upcoming webinars leading up to EE Week 2014. Now that you have all registered for EE Week, you have access to all future webinars and will not need to register again. We will send out details about the February 19th webinar soon. While visiting the archived webinar on our newly redesigned website, please browse around the site to see what new features and resources we've been adding, and stay tuned as we continue to replenish the pages with new blog posts, toolkits, graphics, and updates about EU Week 2014. Thank you to everyone who tuned into the webinar tonight, and thank you once again, again to our great presenters. Our contact information is on the screen now, and if anyone has any follow-up questions or comments about the webinar, uh, feel free to contact one of us. Also, please visit EIE.org to learn more about the great work that Engineering is Elementary has been doing. I'm also going to upload a link to a quick survey in the chat box to the right as soon as we're done. So if you have a few seconds, um, we would love if you took the time to just answer a quick survey. But I will also send this survey out tomorrow to everyone in an email, so you can complete it then if you'd like. Uh, so thanks again to everyone. I hope you all have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I tried to estimate, and I think total, there were about 35.